Well, the help me this morning to bring to the hearts of these who've gathered before you the ponderings you have stirred up in my own heart on this question. Let us listen attentively. You know, many have taken in hand the task of trying to bring out a full, um, you know, biblical response to that question. And I'm certainly not going to finish it today. Hopefully, though, I'll contribute some insight that will help us as we contemplate this question in our current distress. In Jesus' holy name, I'm asking you for that. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Well, well, well. Praise the Lord. Why? Another way to put it is, what is God up to? Or, why doesn't God just wipe them out? I got one amen for that and one chuckle. So I'm not sure where the congregation is on that particular issue. But we're not going to take a vote right now. So anyway, you know, why doesn't God just step in and wipe the smirk off the faces of some of these wicked people who just, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, go on in their wickedness as if just mocking God and mocking our faith? I mean, you've you heard them, I'm sure, going into this so-called pandemic that God isn't going to help us. Did you, you remember that? I'm trying to remember which, I think it was, uh, well, I know Schumer has said stuff like that, but there was some newscaster, I just can't remember his name right now, but he's, uh, if I could, you'd go, oh yeah, that guy. I just can't think of it. But he said, uh, you know, well, God is not going to, God's not going to help us. We need the vaccine. That's, you know, I'm summarizing what he said, but that's what he said. And I thought, well, there goes that vaccine. <laughs> so that isn't going to work out for you. And it didn't, did it? And I remember praying right then, God, show them who's God here. Do something. And he didn't do it the way I wanted him to do it. I don't know how many times I've told you this. I'll tell you again. I'll confess. So many times God vetoes my plan. But he does hear the prayer. And I remember the, the sense of vindication I got when I was listening to Mr. Bill Gates in an interview on a panel, really, talking about where do we go from here? You know, with the COVID thing this way, that way. Where do we go from here? And what do you see coming in the future? Because you know everything, Bill Gates. You got a lot of money. All you need is a lot of money like yours. Then you can be a doctor and a scientist and a immunologist without ever going to school for it. Just have a lot of money and people think you know everything. And in the course of that conversation, he said, right out loud in front of God and everybody, he had to watch it to really appreciate it, but he was not happy to report that Omicron outperformed all of our vaccines. How many of you saw that or heard that? It's just, it's amazing. Oh, you re you've got to go, I was going to say Google it, but we don't Google anymore. We duck, duck, go or something like that. And even duck, duck, go is a problem. Some, yeah, I know. Duck, duck, go has become something of a problem. Uh, the devil just goes in after everything that's decent to corrupt it. So we're, you know, we're still chasing behind him, trying to stay ahead of him and everything. But anyway, coming back to the point, hey, find it. Choose the browser of your that you're, you feel most comfortable with and go find Bill Gates. You could probably, uh, I almost said it again, they've, really, they've done a good job of bedding our brain, embedding our brain, that when you search for something on the Internet, you are Googling it. We've got to break the spirit of error <laughs> that has gripped our mind and take it anyway. I'm joking, sort of, but anyway... Uh, you, you need to find that and watch it because watching it is really the only way to really appreciate what I'm saying. It is clear. In fact, he said, it's sad. That's how he prefaced this remark. 
Sometimes I think God reaches in there and squeezes their wicked little hearts and the truth of what they're really believing goes, pops out of their mouth before they get a chance to catch it. I really do believe that happens. And this was an occasion. He couldn't get his face out of its contorted unhappiness. He was not happy with us. And he said that the Omicron worked better than our vaccines to stop this COVID pandemic. And I thought, thank you, Father. And I want you to hear, I want you to hear this and understand something. Let, let, put this together. And, I, and I, I'm saying this because to get you to understand the power you have in prayer and the, and the presence you have before his throne and the impact you have as your heart responds to things. Look, he's listening. He's listening. He hears you. He hears the mourning of your heart. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. He hears the grieving. He sees the brokenness of your spirit. He sees the stuff he draws nigh. So I'm going to use I'm going to have to share the story on a personal level, but I fear that, you know, not you, but some will misunderstand and think that I'm, you know, like breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. I'm not. I'm giving testimony to a truth that applies to all of us. If you can get hold of what I'm going to say in this little story, this little anecdote, if you can get hold of it and understand that what I'm saying is, every one of you have probably impacted things going on in this world in ways you have no idea. Just, just in a moment of, of a prayer that went from your heart and you didn't even formally present it as a prayer. You didn't like get on your knees and say, I pray the old father. You didn't do any of that. You just had a grieving and a groaning in your spirit and you expressed it in a prayer and God heard that and did something. But you need to do what I have done so many times and, and do regularly. I say, Lord, show me when you answer. Show me the answer. Now, I've taught you and you listened. I know. You don't ask for God. You don't ask God to do something you don't expect him to do. So when you ask God to do something, look for it to happen. If it doesn't happen, follow up on that. Because many times it happened, you just didn't know it. Or it happened in a way you weren't expecting. So I was expecting something else for God to do, but uh, this is exactly what happened. When I heard that news fella say God isn't going to help us in the context where he was pushing the vaccine. In other words, it's clear it was clear to me he was concerned about all these Christians who were going to trust God and not get the vaccine. So he said that, and my heart grieved. I thought, oh, my soul. It wasn't more than 20, 30 years ago when... <laughs> No broadcaster would say something like that. No way. They wouldn't even think of something like that. Or if they did, they would hide it. Now he said that. Not only him, Cuomo also made comments along those lines, by the way. But when I heard that fellow say that, my heart grieved, my spirit groaned, and I prayed. Again, I didn't like stop, go apart somewhere, uh, and do a formal, I just grieved and groaned in my spirit and my heart a prayer. God, do something. Show them that you're God. Respond to this. Respond to what that man said. Do something to show them and the whole world that you're in control. That they can't even invent a virus you can't take down. They can't even create one in a lab that you can't handle. That's the way I prayed. And then I prayed, Lord, show me when you answer the question, when you answer the prayer. Because I've learned over the years, so many times, <coughs> he answers, but I don't get to see it. Well, I want to see the answer. I want to see this, Lord. And nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. You, you, anybody ever been there? Nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. How many of you are like me and you just wish God would hurry up? Hurry up. Why did it take so long? Well, I'm going to try to answer. I'm going to offer some insight into answering that question in just a minute. 
But I was feeling like that, when, it, grieving, you know, over this. All right. Then one day, I just happened upon, by, it, it was providence, I, I believe. See, if, you, if we just believed, you would see so many times when God shows up and does something. But we just don't, we don't really expect him to do anything when we pray in the first place. In the second place, we're very easily discouraged. If it doesn't happen right away, if it doesn't have it happen in the way we were expecting or hoping it would happen, then we just give up on it and just kind of almost subconsciously put it in the pile of God didn't hear me again. God ignored me again. That's what we do. We tend to do that. So <clears throat> I, I pray almost always in connection with some of these kinds of prayers Show me when you when you do something. Show me when you act, because I, I might miss it. Well, it goes on and on and on and on. And then one day, I happened across this video. It wasn't even one somebody sent me and said, you got to look at this. I just stumbled across it. And it was Bill Gates in the center with a paddle and this person. Okay, some of you have seen it, I can tell. And she asked the question, well, what do you make of things? Where's this going to go? I mean, since you predicted the first one, tell us what's going to happen next. And he says, it's sad. And then he goes on to report the Omicron virus worked better than our vaccines. The only point in that conversation where he actually looked like he was feeling a little better is when he said, another one's coming. As God is my witness, this is what happened. And I'm sitting there going, yes! Now, if just the whole world could hear that and see that and, you know, pay attention to it, but they bury it, they hide it, you know, that happens. But God did do that. Imagine how many times that kind of thing happens and you don't even know it happened. So uh, what I want you to, to understand is going into this, is that while I'm going to be dealing with the fretting we all experience, even though we were told fret not, <laughs> but the fretting that we, that we put in front of God and bring in our hands and all this stuff, uh, it's just, it's unbelief. It's a satanic attack trying to compromise you with unbelief so he can cause your prayers to be hindered so you can cause your prayers to be ineffectual. So let's go ahead and get started. We often fret over questions about God's dealings with men. And we're not the first. We're not even among the best of saints who have done this. I mean, some really great saints of God have had this struggle. For example, Job. I'm going to present Two prophets, Jeremiah and Habakkuk. The beloved sweet psalmist of Israel, David. All of these men, great men all, sometimes fretted, if you will, over this question. We just read Jeremiah's. Let's look at Job. Job said, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? I don't know if you're like me in, in this particular regard, probably. <clears throat> but you see, you know, some of these wicked people, some of these people who right now have imprisoned protesters for doing really nothing more than going into the Capitol building. Many of them at the invitation and behest of the guards on duty there. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they're sitting in jail right now and have been in jail for over a year. Coming up on two years now, pretty well. Yeah, well over a year. And they're being treated badly. And it's, it, it, and it's Pelosi and Schumer. These are the people whose authority are under whose authority these people were arrested and put in jail. They haven't even been charged with anything, which is illegal. 
You know how they're getting away with that? Patriot Act. They've designated that a terrorist activity, and so now they can do whatever they want. So these Americans have been stripped of all of their rights. <clears throat> it is absolutely shameful and horrible what these people have done. And we, we live, you know, one reason we can kind of get on with our lives and, 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 and function is because we're ignorant of most of this stuff. But we need to no longer be ignorant of this stuff. We need to, you know, it's like uh, the effort to keep the prisoners of war in front of the people in order to have the political power to force the government to do something about it. You know, you understand that's what that was about? That whole POW movement with the flags and all that stuff? It was about keeping the pressure on the politicians to do something about our prisoners of war and not give up on them. We've got a whole slew of Americans behind him in enemy lines in, um, in Afghanistan right now. whole slew of them. Don't forget them. It's easy to. I mean, we only have so much capacity to carry all this stuff and be able to continue to function. But that's what I hope to help you with and give you access to the throne of grace where you can have the energy and power you need to stand up to this evil. And not just ignore it, but to stand up to it. In any event, when I see these people who are doing these, these horrible things, I can go on with quite a long list, by the way, as you know. I mean, that's just a couple of things here. We could go on and on with stuff. And I see them with their public face and their smirks and their arrogance. And I see and I, and I know that they have millions and billions of dollars that they've milked from the American people, really, by using their power and influence to gain access to opportunities that the average person wouldn't have. All this, that's, that's the Pelosi family. <clears throat> they are wicked. They are vile. And they stand in front of us with their little smirks and, the, and then just lying, one lie after the other. It's irksome. Isn't that a great word, Logan? Irksome. It, 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 it calls up a loathing and anger. Now, what Satan wants to do is to get you all stirred up in wrath. Because if he can succeed at doing that, he can cancel your effectiveness in prayer. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, First of all, prayers be made for all men. Keep reading. Paul says, I would that all men, pray. we pray for all men everywhere, lifting up holy hands, now listen, without wrath and doubting. <clears throat> what we don't understand is that when we slip into a fretting wrath or angry kind of response, now there's a righteous indignation, there are some things that go on, there's no right response to it except to be angry, I get that, but I mean the kind of anger that puts you in the flesh. The kind of anger where basically what happens if you're not careful, you start directing your anger to God. You start getting impatient and irritated with God. If you stand before God with that kind of stuff going on in your heart, you see that's coming from unbelief. That's coming from, well, a different place than the place he wants you to be when you come before his throne. So Job asks, wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? And yet you know the story of Job. He never accused God foolishly. But he had this question. There's nothing wrong with asking the question. And then Jeremiah, we read it earlier, righteous art thou, O Lord. Look how he started this. He said, you're righteous, God, I know that. When I plead with thee, this word plead is, well, we use it. It's a court term, pleading. When you put a plead before a court. A pleading before the court. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the idea here. 
when I come before you formally with a plead. Yet, let me talk with thee of thy judgments. I want to talk to you about your judgments. I'm confused about some things. I bring a plead before your throne room, before your court, but I have some questions about your judgments. <clears throat> and here, here's this question. Wherefore, which is as much as say why, why is it that the way of the wicked prospers? It works for them. They do all these wicked things, and by all appearances, they're succeeding. They enjoy all the accoutrements of success. Why are they happy? Who deal treacherously. And I'm telling you, these people deal treacherously. That was a treacherous thing to do. To pull our troops out of Afghanistan before we secured both our munitions and the American people that were there. That wasn't just a bungling idiot. That was treason. It was treacherous. <clears throat> I'm personally convinced a lot of this, I'm just an old act, is, is an act. And I think he is. But I think it's being used as a cover. So we dismiss much of what's going on as the bungling of an old guy that's inept. And then don't, and we don't see the truth is we're being betrayed. This is betrayal. This is treachery. <clears throat> and Jeremiah asked, why are they happy? Becky and I were watching a little thing <clears throat> with Biden, you know, he gets off the plane or something like that, and somebody asked him about oil prices. What do you think about oil prices? He says, they're going to... No, he asked Biden. He, oh, yeah, he blames Putin, that's right. And, and But uh, Biden says, they're going to go up. And then something was asked, I think it was something to the effect, what are you going to do about it? Whatever. He says, well, there's not much we can do about it. Putin's doing this. He says, Putin's doing this. Yeah, we know it was going on before. We know it's a bunch of lies. Sadly, however, there are about 30% of the population who believe all this junk. <clears throat> and you, now you've heard, that's the line right now. Russia's doing it, Russia's doing it, Russia's doing it. They're pushing that hard. This is, this is treachery. Biden knows... This would never have happened under Trump. And he knows what Trump did so that it wouldn't happen. Look, what I'm trying to get at is they wanted this to happen in Ukraine. Now, I can assemble a whole bunch of evidence for this. You know, all kinds of stuff I can pull together. And when you look at it, you go, yeah, hard to believe that that was an accident. But they send Harris over to Europe. And she makes a declaration of how happy she is that Zelensky wants to come into NATO. Now, I don't have time to develop. This is more of a brain massage type thing where I'd go into it in somewhat <laughs> in my radio show. And uh, so bear with me, but I do want to lay this foundation down. <laughs> that seems so inept. It seems so like such bunglers, such absolute, just incompetence. That's what it looks like. What I want you to understand is that's a ruse. That's a facade. You rip that facade behind and you are looking at treachery. This is on purpose. And why are they allowed to be happy who deal very treacherously. Habakkuk said, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. 
And upon the basis of that truth, he asks, wherefore or why do you look upon them that deal treacherously and hold your tongue? Why do you hold your tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Why are you sitting there silent, allowing these things to go on and not doing anything about it? Habakkuk asked that. A prophet of God. A man that walked with God. A man that knew God, knew Him well. A man who was among those that were taken up by the Holy Ghost and moved to bring forward the mind and the heart and the will of God and to put it in front of us. And that means that the Holy Spirit Himself has brought this question out of the heart of Habakkuk before the throne of God. Why? David asked, Psalm 10, verse 13, wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? And then he said, in some cases, or actually more than once, he said, for example, Psalm 73, 2, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's quite a confession, isn't it? I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, to be honest, of course, you go through the rest of the psalm and he resolves. He sorts it out. He gets back, he gets his legs of faith back. So he got the wind knocked out of him by these observations, but over a short time he gets his wind back. None of these great saints sat there in this case. Every one of them made their way back to a standing of faith and confidence in God. But they did ask the question. God does not recoil from such questions. Indeed, he invites us, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Job sought an audience with God where he would order his cause or, in our language, order his case before the throne or the judgment of God and present his arguments. In other places, God has invited the saint. Present your strong arguments. Present your, strong, present your case. Now, that's an amazing thing. You know, no, no heathen God would do that. The heathen gods, if you question them, they want to squash you like a bug. The Bible says that wisdom is easily entreated, and that means that wisdom is open to being questioned. That's the, char that's the characteristic of wisdom. A characteristic of foolishness or tyranny is an anger response anytime they're questioned. That's something to keep in mind, by the way. <clears throat> you saw, you, you have seen how Biden has responded to questions he doesn't want to answer. Call one guy a jerk. Yeah, that's what tyrants do. You know what that man would do if he could get away with it to all of his political opponents. He would do what Putin's famous for doing. Have him knocked off. Some of you have seen the list of suspicious deaths of people that were connected in one way or the other with, with Hillary and Bill who got crosswise with them. It's a long list. So when we judge ourselves, we can obtain mercy. I didn't preface that correctly. I apologize. So I'm going to offer you two major reasons that from God's perspective, he holds back judgment. One of them is and you're going to say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't apply to any of the stuff you just presented. Well, you've got to be patient. 
We'll get over there in just a minute. <coughs> but let's start here, because this is applicable to us. You've heard me say it before, and you've thought it before yourself, I'm sure, or heard it from else, from others. <laughs> you got to think about it. When you're asking, God judge, God judge, God judge, He starts with us. And you've heard me explain this already. And I believe God revealed this to my heart in, in meditation and prayer about this thing. <laughs> One reason God doesn't move swiftly to begin the judgment we're calling for is because he would start in his own house. And when he looks at his own house, it's not ready. So let's consider this principle. It's a very important one. If we judge ourselves, we don't need to be judged. We need to judge ourselves. I think God's giving us a space to repent, if you will. A time for His own in His house to judge themselves. <clears throat> and that's one reason judgment delays. In other words, here's what I want you to realize. We're asking for God to bring judgment upon these smug, smirking, wicked, oppressing rulers. And we're asking for that, and it's just, it seems to be not happening. Well, we're the ones that are in the way of that. We are in the way of that. Let me help you understand this. Here's his church to whom he's given the dominion and given the kingdom and the power. And behind them is all the wicked that these guys have allowed to get into power. That's what's happened. We allowed this. There's that one inch of territory that darkness has gained in this country that we, the children of light, didn't give them. So that's the scenario. That's the situation here. And I mentioned this last week. The people back here, the children of darkness, have certainly and do certainly do much more evil than these people here, but we turned out the lights which allowed them to prosper. Remember, that was last week's message. So keeping that in mind now, we want God to hit them, if, if you will, and we want God to bring judgment upon them. We want God to vindicate us against them. And God wants to do that too, so he wants to move forward in judgment, but we are in his way. Because he has to go through us to get to him. He has to start in his own house. So in some measure, we are the reason the judgment tarries. And he wants us to judge ourselves so that we won't need to be judged. And that brings you to Ezekiel chapter 9. How many times have you heard me refer you to Ezekiel chapter 9? Nobody's, nobody's taking hash marks? Or keeping track? Often. Because I believe that and chapter 18 of Ezekiel, those are the two chapters we should be looking at. Not 38 and 39. We should be looking at 9 and 18. <clears throat> Nine, which calls us to sigh and cry for the sins of the people. And that's the sigh and cry for the sins of the remnant. Indeed, we're concerned about the sins of the wicked, but that's not what's in God's way. What's in God's way are the sins of his own people. So we need to sigh and cry for the sins of the people. <laughs> if you look at Ezekiel 9, he's talking about his own congregation. Because the judgment was going to begin in his house and extend out throughout the congregation. So we need to judge ourselves. If we will judge ourselves, we can hope to obtain mercy. 
If we judge ourselves, we can have that mark of humility upon our forehead set so that when that judgment is released, God won't have to consume his entire congregation. We need to judge ourselves. Mercy is terribly misunderstood. <clears throat> Just to give you some help with that, by analogy in the Old Testament, the mercy seat wasn't out there in public. Do you realize nobody could walk up to the mercy seat? Nobody. The ordinary person had no access to the mercy seat. It was behind a veil. And only one person, the high priest, could go behind that veil It was behind a veil. And only one person, the high priest, could go behind that veil only one day in the year. And only after the proper blood sacrifice was made. And he could only get behind that veil that huge price in order to give us that access. Mercy was hidden from man behind a veil. You can't come in here without the blood sacrifice. The judgment for sin must be recognized and initiated. The wages of sin is death. And the blood of the innocent animal who died in the place... <clears throat> this really blows people's minds who've been under the ministry of Gracie's who completely pervert the whole doctrine of grace and make it, make it terrible. They just ruin it. They cheapen it and really contort it into something God never intended it to be. Listen to this. When the bowels thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore... He that made them will not have mercy on them. Oh. So there is a circumstance, a situation, in which God says, no mercy. None. You don't get it. See, we think of mercy as something God's always just ready to be merciful. Watch out. He is merciful. He prepares them every morning. But he doesn't distribute them cavalierly. Here he told people, I'm not going to have mercy. Hosea 2 verse 4, And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. There has to be a cause. God is not cavalier about his extension of mercy. And someone says, well, that's Old Testament, is it? Listen to the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. He's speaking of himself. He says he was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because. Oh, there's a because to mercy? Paul said, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Does that suggest that he might have found himself in the category of those we just looked at upon whom God would refuse to have mercy? If he had done it defiantly and arrogantly and just was abandoned into sin as an agent of evil, as an agent of sin? Well, you, you decide. What do you think it means? Consider the witness of the Spirit regarding obtaining mercy being conditional. 
Look at this. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, that's a meaningless statement, unless it's true, that this is a prequalification for obtaining mercy. If, if, this, if this verse is not saying that is a precondition for obtaining mercy, you must yourself be merciful, then it's a waste of words. It's obviously the point he's making. The merciful will obtain mercy. This goes with that statement he made <laughs> with regard to, the, <coughs> to what's called the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> I forgot to pray and ask Jesus to help me with my coughing. Please. <clears throat> when Jesus, after he gave us what we call the Lord's Prayer, it's really more like the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17. Nevertheless, the prayer he gave us as a model to help us exercise ourselves in a pattern of prayer to understand how to pray and so on. Teach us how. Did you know that when you look at that in Matthew 6, he follows that up with a particular focus on forgiveness. And he says... If you don't forgive others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. Now we have to just, we have to open up our toolbox and get the biggest wrench we have called the dispensational wrench and get in there and set that thing and just twist that verse right out of having any meaning to us at all. <clears throat> I just don't think that's the right way to use dispensationalist. I'm a dispensationalist. But that's a misuse of that truth. That has application in this way. Obviously, it doesn't mean we go to hell if we fail to forgive somebody. It does mean, however, we're going to be held to account for that. When I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be brought up. Right here, see that pile of junk? Wood, hay, and stubble, you see that? That was your unwillingness to forgive your brother. That's what he's telling you. It won't be forgotten. It won't be just ignored. It won't be just set aside. You're going to be held to account for it. I can go deeper into it. We don't need to right now. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow, what does that say about both mercy and grace? If you don't come before this throne... This is where you get it. Because of the abuses of some who put believers in a kind of bondage of almost a sort of tyranny about, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? So many preachers went so far the other extreme that we've completely eliminated the whole idea of conditions. There are conditions. There's if and then. It's all over the place in the Bible. If this, then this. There's even one guy named Eli who was given a promise that he would be established in the priesthood forever throughout all of his generations after him. And then God came to Eli one day and said, I did indeed say that you would stand before me forever. But listen to me, fella. Now, that's my words, not God's. You understand? But listen to me. Whoever honors me, that's who I'll honor. You, isn't that amazing? He who honors me, that's the guy I'll honor. You've dishonored me. You're fired. That's what happened. You're fired, Eli. You're out. He also fired Saul, who was given a similar promise. Solomon was told, if you stay in the pattern of your father David, then you'll continue on in the throne forever. The whole doctrine, the whole concept of conditions has been beaten to death. Unconditional, unconditional, unconditional. I mean, I get it. God's gracious beyond measure, and amen. But there are conditions. I mean, he wants everybody to go to heaven 
on the condition that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead and call upon his name to be saved. Well, we need to understand that we need to go before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in times of need. And here are the requirements for obtaining this mercy, this grace that we need. First, judge yourself. Judge yourself. 1 Corinthians 11.31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not need, we, we should not be judged. But listen to this. This is a very interesting. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. What we're being told there is if you will judge yourself, the Father doesn't have to judge you. I mean, I, times I told Zachary that. So if you repent, if you confess your sin and repent of it, I wouldn't have to spake you. But if you're stubborn and rebellious and you refuse to repent and own up, own responsibility for your behavior, I have to chasten you. That's just an easy way for you to understand it. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. He's our Father. If we judge ourselves, then He can put the rod down. But if we refuse to judge ourselves, He'll put the rod on. So one reason God restrains judgment is for mercy's sake. But what about when we have gone beyond and God has determined that we've reached mercy's limit? That does happen. We read about it earlier. Well, the second condition in which God refrains from correcting, refrains from chastening, refrains from judging is this. It's when he knows it will do no good. Open your Bible to Isaiah. Find chapter 1. Let's look at verse 5. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5. We're at the conclusion here. Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 5. The Bible says, why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. There's another reason that God withholds judgment, chastening from his own even. And he's talking about his own people here. He said, why would thy, why would thou be stricken anymore? He was not talking about the world. He was talking about his own congregation. Why would I chasten you anymore? You're at the place in your rebellion and in your stubbornness where if I chasten you, you'll just go more and more in revolt. That's advice for parents too, by the way. You need to watch out for that. There's a point at which your chastening your child is doing more damage than good. That can happen. You need to watch out for that. But God is saying concerning his own people, why would I, why would I bother chasing you? All you're going to do is revolt more and more. So another reason that God withholds a chastening or a judgment that would be for our good. Hebrews 12 makes that clear. The re His motive for chastening us is that we might humble ourselves and be drawn into greater holiness so he can impart his holiness to us and we can have fellowship. That's what chastening is about. So here's a reason that God doesn't step in with the chastening that we need it's when we get to a place where the chastening would, would only make us angry and revolt. And when we come to a place like that, 
the only thing left is destruction. See, the chastening is constructive. Chastening is constructive. You got that? But if we are beyond chastening, so that there could be no value in chastening, then the only thing left is destruction. And God sometimes hesitates to let go of destruction. In fact, he always does. I mean, you've got the several examples of this. Genesis 6. I've had it. The whole human race is done, but he kept looking for somebody. Found one man, saved humanity. The number of times he was going to judge his people in the wilderness. He told Moses in one case, step aside, let me at him, I'm going to wipe him out. We'll start all over with you. Moses said, don't do it. And so God didn't. God looks for an intercessor. He looks for somebody who will stand in that gap and be an intercessor. I think that, you know, if you think about it, God was ready to act just then. But when Moses stepped into the gap, God wasn't just going to ignore and go over Moses to drop the judgment. So he stopped and he listened to what Moses had to say first. Now, I believe that's what God had in mind, what God was looking for. Well, one reason the judgment might be delaying is because at this point, a chastening falling upon the people of God, they're so confused and so bewildered. <laughs> Tonight, I follow up on this to show you what was the mindset of the people in Jeremiah's day. It is bizarre. There's one case, for example, they say to Jeremiah, look, you've told us to repent and all this. Okay, look, we've been baking cakes to the queen of heaven for a long time. You understand that, Jeremiah? And we're just going to keep doing that. It's amazing. And when I show you the parallel to the condition of the church today with that particular situation, it's disturbing. Do you think you've gotten a little bit of help here with this question? Have a little more insight into why, what's going on right now? Glad. Let's stand together, please. <clears throat> well, I hope I never get to the place where I'm beyond chastening. If any of you feel like maybe you've crossed that line, you've gone to a place where you're beyond chastening, and you'll, some of the symptoms that you're either getting there or have crossed that line is this, when you get really furiously angry with God when He chastens you. If you get really just just leave me alone sorry acting like that he's very likely someday going to say okay so be careful about that but if you've had that spirit or been wrapped up in that somewhere that should be an alarm an alert that goes off that says warning 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 it's like when Jesus responded to those people that were saying that what he did he did by the power of Satan he said watch out warning you're about to step into blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. There's no forgiveness for that one. I, I'm going to sound the alarm right now. If you found yourself becoming irritated with God, you get kind of almost violent, as, as it were, in response to God's chastening. And then he backs off all of a sudden. Don't think you won that argument. You did not win that argument. You just lost hugely the only right, right way to respond to chastening is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that's the only right way humble yourself under the mighty hand of God okay so the invitation hopefully is clear to you you know what God has said to you respond to that amen church go ahead and respond to God spend some time with him talking about whatever it is that wherever the message intersected with your needs and your and your heart and 
where God made some kind of a point or impression upon your heart, focus on that and spend some time talking to God about it right now.